Welcome. My name is Earthrin Cousin, and I'm a distinguished fellow in the Global Food and Agriculture Program at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thanks to you all, and especially our members, for joining us via Zoom for this on the record conversation entitled Building Better, More Resilient Food Systems. Thank you to our sponsor, Bayer, for their support. With full disclosure, I serve as a member of the Bayer Supervisory Board. The Chicago Council is a nonprofit, independent, and nonpartisan platform. The views expressed by the individuals, the panelists, the participants are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. In about 30 minutes or so, we look forward to incorporating your questions into our conversation. Please visit ccga.live, L-I-V-E, where you can submit a question and vote for other questions to be included in this dialogue. So let's begin. With more than 800 million people regularly going to bed hungry, even before COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, food security was a major challenge in many parts of the world. As we to address the challenges of this COVID pandemic, we witnessed the detrimental impact of shelter in place orders on food security agricultural productivity, our global food systems, and particularly a detrimental impact on smallholder farmers. Across the globe, some 500 million smallholder farmers provide as much as 80% of the food consumed in most low and many middle income countries. In fact, a significant percentage of these, these farmers are included in the world's more than 800 million food insecure people. The challenges of small farmers and of our food system were unbared to the world during this COVID response. When talking about our food systems, governments, foundations, and agricultural opinion leaders around the world are calling for the need to build back better after this COVID pandemic. So how do we build back better? To answer this question, I am pleased to introduce our speakers for today's conversation. Liam Condon. Liam serves as the president of the Bayer Crop Science Division. He is also a member of the, of the Bayer Board of Management. As president, Liam leads the Bayer Crop Science vision and business operations. Together with his team, he is bringing agricultural innovation and sustainability to the forefront. Diane Holdorf. Diane is the managing director of food, uh, director of food and nature at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the WBCSD, located in Geneva. The WBCSD is a CEO membership organization of over 200 leading businesses working together to accelerate the global transition to a sustainable world. And finally, Ruramiso Mashumba. Ruramiso is the chief executive officer and founder of Imnandi Africa an African organization that helps rural women combat poverty and malnutrition by empowering them with skills and knowledge in agriculture, nutrition, markets, and technology. Liam, Diane, Ruramiso, Ruramiso, thank you so much for joining us today. So let's start with you, Liam. To, this, to answer this question of building sustainable agricultural food systems, building back better after the pandemic, particular emphasis is being placed on the need for more market-based solutions supported by public-private partnerships. How is the Bayer Crop Science Division responding to this question? 
Uh, thanks a lot, Erthrim, for the kind invitation to be here today. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to join this panel on this really important topic. So um, I think the overall COVID crisis has basically, as you outlined, exposed the fragility of the food system. And we knew this food system was under pressure before the COVID crisis. And the cracks in the system have, have, have become very, very clear to everybody. And I think the cracks in the system in the Northern Hemisphere um, were possibly related to some products, some food products not being necessarily available on shelves, but was less about the potential lack of food and people starving. This is very different in the Southern Hemisphere, where there is a real risk that the economic consequences of the COVID-related health crisis um, actually lead to a hunger crisis. And I think this is something that the world needs to be alarmed about where we need to take action. So from our point of view, there, there's three topics and three ways that we believe we need to, to act in order to improve the resilience of the food system. Number one is to put smallholders first. Um, as you said, there's 500 million smallholders around, around the world. These tend to be the most vulnerable of all farmers. And they often tend to have lack access to any kind of quality inputs, lack of, lack of access to markets. And if a food system breaks down, they are the ones who suffer most, but they deliver 80% of the food to people in developing markets and also export, export markets. World. So putting smallholders at the focus of our efforts is key. As Bayer, we've set an ambitious target to, uh, to enable 100 million smallholders by 2030. A second point is um, access to innovation. Um, there's been fantastic advances in science and technology and data sciences, digital technology, but not all of this innovation is available to farmers everywhere. And if we want to make the food system as resilient as possible, we have to enable our farmers with more innovation. We think this is absolutely crucial and key going forward. And this is why Bayer is investing more than double anybody else out there in research and development to further advance uh, innovation for farmers. The third point that I would say is really important if we want to build back better, we have put sustainability at the core of our business models. And here, uh, I, I think it's absolutely crucial that we don't just reward farmers for the amount of crops, the volume of crops that they produce, but actually also reward them for their services to the ecosystem. As, as you know, I mean, farming today is part of the problem of climate change because of, of the emissions, maybe it's 23, 25% of global emissions, but farming has the possibility to also sequester carbon, and we think farmers should be paid for this. And that's why we're encouraging business models that would actually encourage this and allow farmers to be paid for that additional effort that they're made off of nature. And all of this, we can only do with partners. These problems are too complex to solve alone. So whether it's pu public or private partnerships, we can only do this together with others. That's what we're working on there. Sorry. That's great, Liam. The, the idea of empowering farmers but doing this through partnerships is, is, Diane, right into the questions that I want to talk to you about. Your corporate members uh, embraced achieving SDG2 and food insecurity and addressing challenges of malnutrition while increasing agricultural pro production um, long before COVID pandemic. Your members understand achieving food security requires a transition from silo thinking to partnerships, as Liam's just been talking about, and systems thinking. Achieving global food nutrition through sustainable, durable food systems. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected the thinking and actions of your members regarding how we create sustainable food systems? Or has it? You're on mute, Diane. Thank you so much for posing that question, Earth. Really appreciate it. It's great to be here today with uh, this wonderful panel. It absolutely has, Earthrin, challenged our members to continue to accelerate how they're rethinking what it means to transform the food system. As you said, this issue of knowing that we had to really change the way we think about how we produce, make, 
sustainable food that's nutritious for humans and safe for our planet is one that we've been aware of and working towards. What COVID did was put this into extremely sharp relief. It highlighted where the risks and fragilities were faster than anything that we could have probably predicted. What we've done with our member companies and other partners is taken a very deep look at what are the most urgent disruptions that we need to address while thinking longer term around how do we build a more resilient recovery. We in the food system as a vital supply chain are still actually in early days of response and thinking now towards what will recovery look like. And that together will help us shape what do those actions together as business leaders? How do we work together with partners, as Liam was saying? And what are the types of asks? How do we raise our voice on these issues? So let me just tell you a little bit about what this work has looked like in its first two and a half months of digging in deep with business leaders. What we've identified is that there are systemic challenges, there are issues across the food value chain. There are specific issues, as Liam pointed out, by geography, actually seeing specific risks by commodity as well. To build a little bit on the setup that you shared, Earthrun, and some of the points that Liam raised, I'd like to highlight a couple of the challenges that together with our member companies using all kinds of different data sources and analysis with input from key partners and UN agencies as well, there was three primary systemic challenges to be addressed first as we think about this resilient recovery. One is nutrition security. COVID really threatens nutritional outcomes across the world. Liam, you spoke to this already. We're seeing this impact, particularly developing nations, extremely urgently. But what I would add to that is the economic crisis that COVID has created and the massive income losses due to job losses have put families at every part of society really at risk. Where we see low income and loss of income families, we're seeing real nutrition security challenges there as well. This means we're keeping a very close eye on food prices. We don't want to see food prices rising, particularly in countries that rely heavily on imports, but even where we see specific value chains breaking down in countries, like we saw early on in the U.S. with some of the meat production facilities. And then this issue of farmer financing, and particularly as you've already touched on, and that we'll hear more in just a minute, smallholder farmer financing. They are most at risk when financial flows due to market shutdowns or harvest access uh, haltages really start to hit them. So this means as we look at the food value chain, we're seeing challenges in the production space that our members are taking action on. We're seeing a lot of challenges in transportation and logistics. This will likely start to ease a bit as air travel um, ramps back up and as we start to see normalized sea and rail transport. But we're really watching out for border and port delays and where we see high demand for storage and particularly in cold chains. And then our customers are also raising issues around retail and consumption risks. Again, this comes back to the household purchasing power, but also this huge shift from people eating out, particularly in the developed markets, has been rapid, but even meat market scenes that we see in the developing economies, this has shifted with people having to stay home and the way people are accessing and consuming food is really changing and putting a significant demand uh, signal into the markets. So I can talk more about the where we're seeing some of the specific geographies and some of the specific commodity challenges, but what I'll close with before handing it back to you, Arthur, is this is really indicated with the vast majority of our members, we're starting to see what businesses are doing to create a good COVID-19 response. And this is around how we protect employees, not just in our own operations, but across the value chains. This need to build these collective leadership and partnerships. How we look at our value chains for adaptability and flexibility in ways that we hadn't anticipated. 
what we need to do together to accelerate producer focused responses, particularly in ways that ensure continuous cash flow. And then, of course, we can't ignore the reality around the necessary relief efforts, but how we do that responsibly. So these are the actions that businesses are taking together with other partners that I'll be happy to dig into further as we continue. But with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Earthrun. Well, thank you very much, Diane, for those comprehensive remarks giving us a really good sense of the broad, expansive issues that your members are focused on as they address this challenge of building better uh, and a more resilient food system. Rura Miso, we've heard both of our previous speakers talk about small farmers. And from across the developing world, particularly on the continent of Africa, we're hearing a demand for more local inclusion in decision-making. I often hear the comment, nothing about us without us from local leaders like yourselves. How, listening to these representatives of, of large corporations, how can multinational food corporations best support small farmers? And how can small far, smallholder farmers be a part of the solution for developing more resilient food systems. What are we missing? Thank you very much, Ethrin. Um, it's fantastic being here and sharing, the vo uh, sharing from a voice of a farmer. You know, farmers, smallholder farmers make up 70% of food produced on the continent that people eat. But for so long, rural communities haven't been they seem to lag behind in terms of development. Um, I think looking at COVID right now, we are realizing how important smallholder farms are in terms of development. You find that access to electricity, access to internet connectivity is not that good in these rural communities. Yet these are the, the people who produce food for us to eat. So when we look, when we think about that, we realize that there's a lot of, there's a huge gap um, out there that we should be looking at and focusing on. How can these farmers be able to access markets? Right now with COVID, smallholder farmers, a lot of them find it hard to access markets. All roads have been closed. And that means that they're unable to take their produce to markets, which is very different from bigger commercial farmers. So when I look at what can partners do, I think we need to come hand in hand. I like what Leah mentioned in terms of the importance of sustainable farming. I think all these things are now being highlighted, especially with, when we look at what's happening with COVID. It's important for us to look at how can we work with smallholder farmers, not just giving them aid, not just giving them stuff, but making sure that these farmers are able to produce sustainably. We have lagged behind in terms of, um, in terms of producing food in a sustainable way. And when you look at even access to information in rural communities, when there isn't, when there isn't good connectivity, how do farmers access this information that we need them to access? I think there's a lot that we need to do as a global village, not just looking in one part of the world. But with COVID, we have realized that what happens in the north affects the south greatly. And these are things that we should all come together as thought leaders and decide on how can we produce food in a more sustainable way. Because we only have one planet. And if we burn out our planet, we can't get another planet. So these are some of the things that we, we're talking about continuously in Zimbabwe with other farmers. How can we work with farmers all around the world to produce food in a better way, in a sustainable way? And a lot of the times, I'm, I'm glad I'm here just as a farmer because many times when we're excluded in these conversations, when you mentioned about policies and what's the way forward, it seems people speak for us and sometimes they speak and because it's not necessarily what they think we go through is what we go through. What we go through might not be exactly what they think we are going through. So I'm glad to be here and to really have this conversation in terms of food, because food is very important to everyone. Without food, we're unable to survive. So thinking about sustainable farming, sustainable food systems, sustainable communities, access to farmers, access in terms of all development across, this is very essential for us to develop our food systems. I, I hear you, Ruramiso, and I want to turn to Liam to respond to that because you and, ba and Bayer, Bayer have a commitment to supporting 100 million smallholder farmers. 
And so how does the work of buyer come together with the work of organizations like uh, Rumorisa's? Yeah, so I, I have to say I completely agree with, with Rura Miso and, and I can maybe explain a little bit how also our thinking has evolved over time. Um, I think m maybe many years ago, the, the approach of a, of a company like ours would have been, let's make our, our wonderful products available and, and things will work out and life will get better. And, and, and I think we learned over over many years that that was just not a sustainable approach and, and definitely not a scalable approach. And I think what we've learned over, over the years is um, we have to take what we call now an ecosystem approach and look at, at specific geographies. What is the local situation? Um, what are the issues, uh, as Rudy Miso said, what are the specific, the real issues that, that farmers, smallholder farmers are facing, not the ones we think they're facing, what are they really facing? And then develop solutions with partners that will address those issues along the value chain. So a simple um, concrete example, uh, often there's issues around as to financing, so microfinancing solutions, ma making that available. Um, insurance, micro insurance, making that available. Access to quality inputs, which is something we can do, but that in and of itself is simply not enough. Um, access to good agronomic information, so education about good agronomic sustainable practices. Access to markets, to off takers, and um, transparency on market pricing. These, these are all elements that we now, in the approach that we take is rather through what we call this ecosystem approach, develops a, an, an approach that's locally relevant, involves a multitude of different partners, public and private, to set up an, an ecosystem that's relevant and addresses the core issues that, that smallholders are facing. So that, I think, has been the learning that we've had so far. This is not easy to do um, because it involves multiple different parts, but I personally believe it's the only way forward. And those partners can't be just kind of headquartered partners. They need to be locally relevant partners uh, to, be, to be sustainable. So let me first of all remind our members, our listeners, that if you're interested in participating in this dialogue, and we hope you will join us in the dialogue, please go to ccga.live and type questions and uh, join us in this conversation. Diane, Liam just talked about an ecosystem approach and focusing and working with local partners. M many of the discussions amongst your colleagues and your members over the past weeks have been around long food systems versus local and regional food systems and the need for strengthening those local food systems and local ecosystems. What is the conversation that is happening amongst your members about how to support these local ecosystems that we just described and Rumoriso just talked about is so essential to building sustainability? The act, it's really interesting the things that we've talked about is with COVID, there's no time to create something new. We have to be able to lean in to really amplify something that exists that we can all collectively build faster, better to respond. And we've actually been doing deep dives on what are those best platforms or best partnerships where together we can address some of these biggest disruptions. We've identified specific actions and areas for collective work together in geographies like Latin America and Southeast Asia, India, and in several African countries as well, particularly in areas like getting nourishables or this harvest access issue that was raised or how we can help move money faster to farmers who are most at risk. So it's by sharing this type of information along with the concrete data that we're seeing the fastest ability to react to come together. This is information that is not yet out in the public domain. Some of these things we've already been able to publish because of course, by sharing this information, people can move faster. Even companies who aren't members 
they can see what's being shared by these bigger organizations and take that and move on these things without having to invest as much time as, as some of our, our members in our work has done. They can move faster that way. What we'll be doing is sharing very shortly some of these key platforms as well so that we can say, hey, come, let's join forces here. There's a great example for that, uh, um, for example, that Syngenta and Bayer and Yara have all created in Africa where there's a fast response platform that we could all lean into and work on together. So it's the, by, by identifying and lifting and highlighting and sharing those types of things that we think that we can move not just faster with the members that we have, but really help accelerate that to other companies, large and across these regions as well. So I, I appreciate that some of this information is not published and that we are the, the, the first to hear about much of the work that is happening by your members and we look forward to hearing more. So Ruramiso, back to you as the recipient of much of the benefit of the, of the initiatives that have been described by both Liam as well as Diane. When you think about the needs of your members, of the women that you work with, what is the priority? There, you named a list of them from electricity to access to um, access to finance. Um, but if you were required to prioritize, and often we are, what would you say is if if you if the world were listening to you today, what are the top priorities that your members need these organizations, these companies to focus on? Thank you very much, Ashley, for that question. I was hoping you would ask. I like what Liam said about the holistic approach. You see, for many years, we've only had, we only get um, either access to information, access to finance, access to maybe some type of technology, which is what most organizations bring, but we don't really get the holistic approach. So if I was to um, say, what do we need? I think the future is an, a holistic approach. To, we need a package where farmers get access to information, then followed up by the access to the correct inputs that they need to grow. Because it doesn't help for you to just get the access to the information, to know the know-how, but not really know how to then access the, that, um, the inputs that you need. But in order for you to access the inputs, you still need access to finance, which is tailor-made for your needs. Um, and then you also need the access to the, to the technology to produce the food, which then leads to the market. So it's so difficult in agriculture to only say, let's give them one thing. Because I think that's what most NGOs have been doing for decades and decades, giving one thing, giving information on how, do you, how to grow climate smart um, agriculture crops. But then where do the farmers find the climate smart equipment? It becomes, un it's maybe it's not even accessible in that country, and then they have to import it. They don't have the money to import it. Then the information becomes irrelevant. So I'll say, I'll answer you to say that we cannot have one um, solution. We need to have a holistic approach. This is what we promote at Munandi Africa is supporting farmers to access um, information, technology, the tools so that they can produce and increase their yields, which therefore results in increasing income. When we look at it that way, we will see poverty reduced, you know, a, a significant amount. But if we continue just to give people the, the equipment, they don't know how to use the equipment, the equipment um, breaks, there's no access to service, then we're continuously going around in a vicious circle, wasting a lot of resources. And right now, it is our time to, to come together and look at holistic approaches that would change the lives of millions of people. Thank you. A holistic approach. I appreciate that. Not just one solution is going to solve the problem. And Liam, we've been focused on small farmers and primarily on the developing world. But to, to I know there are many in our audience who want, would ask the question, but we've seen food system failures across the developed as well as the developing world during COVID. Um, what if anything, 
is com are companies like yours doing to address the, the, the food system failures that we've witnessed as a part of COVID, uh, the COVID response in the developed world? Thanks, Catherine. So um, I, I think we really have to differentiate between the, the, the nature of, of disruption that took place in, in, let's call it the Northern Hemisphere, America, Europe, um, versus the Southern southern Hemisphere, um, because a lot of, of the breakdown had actually to do with a demand side, um, because demand patterns changes, as Diana said, Diana, um, basically demand patterns changed overnight. And most um, uh, food systems and, and crops are, are often tailored to specific outlets, to specific industries, whether it's the restaurants or, or airlines or, or whatever it is. And if suddenly all the restaurants are shut down and airlines don't need catering anymore, that that food um, then it's, it, it can end up just being because it cannot be switched quickly enough from a distribution point of view to grocery stores because that's a different distribution system. So I think that the key learning in, in here is um, we, we have in essence a, a fragile system that tends to work um, very efficiently. But if there's a shock either on the demand side, if demand completely shuts down, or on the supply side, um, like what happened then on, in the meat supply chain, then the system is not really able to deal with those shocks. Um, and this is why we need to work on making the overall system more, more resilient. Um, and, and this requires then, as, as Diana said as well, you gotta really look into then the specific crop and, and demand uh, uh, patterns to be able to improve the overall. The, the one thing I would add um, for farmers, um, particularly in, in North America and, and Europe, um, I think farmers everywhere are under have been under pressure for quite some time from an economic point of view. They, they don't earn enough um, for the, the, all the hard work that they do and the contribution that they actually make to society and basically feeding and fueling um, entire societies. And again, this often goes back to the issue that they're only reward volumes of crops. And, and I think if we work more on uh, business models that incentivize sustainability, and again, for example, uh, incentivizing carbon sequestration, that would open up an additional uh, uh, send a source of income for farmers and help address climate change at the time. So I think this is something that we need to really rapidly make progress on. And this is something where COVID actually gives us an opportunity now to accelerate progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, Diane, I'm, I'm going to you because you're nodding because you represent members who work across the entire food system. And, and when Liam was talking about our system being more efficient yet not as agile, as we need, uh, particularly here in the United States, we saw the two food systems, the one that supports the institutions, uh, as he described, completely fail uh, when there was no market and no demand for those products because of how those products are produced. Um, and uh, and the, the question becomes, is this an opportunity for us to address some of these really tough questions uh, that would, before COVID, many would have said were too hard to focus on and answer, including the question of carbon sequestration. Over to you, Diane. Yeah, I think, Earthrun, not only did it show how hard wired our distribution systems are, it also showed, it created this whole new awareness around food waste and loss. You know, I've never heard so many people talking about not just the devastation to farmer livelihoods for having to destroy all their milk or their poultry or their, um, their vegetables, but what that loss meant for people who were at that point in time hungry or needing that food. That's, I think, the tipping point that allows us to say, okay, it's hard, but we have got to figure this out. It's when that consumer engagement really starts to kick in. So what we've seen already starting is a bit of a rethink on farm to market lines of travel and how things move relative to, you know, this classic what you buy in bulk versus what you buy packed. 
market? How do you start to shift the ways that um, they production from the farm level is assigned the type of coding that food manufacturers who still really need that product can take into their facilities? How do you maintain food safety, which is of course critical in all of our markets globally, when you start to shift into different types of recipes in food manufacturing because your ingredients are coming in in different ways? It's created a different type of conversation than what used to be the way of operating. It doesn't mean that it is, although it's hard, it doesn't mean that it's impossible. So we've started to see a couple of really specific examples as it relates to specific vegetable and fruit supply chains, for example, in the US, certainly as it relates to some poultry supply chains within the US. And we're seeing people rethink what does local mean? How do we access those crops? But what we're also seeing, and I think is a cause for concern, is through this decoupling of what has been a tremendously global food supply system, an actual challenge from a U.S. farmer perspective, because U.S. farmers do export so much of their crops, when that export market breaks down or demand starts to move to other markets, that is going to have other as well. Now, I think our other two panelists have done an amazing job highlighting what it means in an in a emerging market that is much more fragile from a food security standpoint to think about localization of food supply. And in some cases, it's it can be easier to localize in those markets that don't have these really entrenched food value chain lines of distribution but yet might have other market access challenges. I know you know this really well also. Being able to get product into local market looks different in these more um, challenged food supply chain local markets in, in, in emerging and developing economies. So focus needs to be placed in both directions, in both types of markets, for how do we rethink, and this is happening real time right now, how do we rethink these global supply chains, particularly when it comes to our largest commodity ingredients, be it corn or rice or soy or some of our meats, and really think about shifting. This is an opportunity as companies are starting to look at is diversifying into other types of ingredients that they can use that don't rely on these big global supply chain infrastructures that can have real benefit for us from a nutritional standpoint, from an ingredient diversification standpoint, from a farmer income diversification standpoint, but that also requires, as Teresa has saying, a lot of support back into those farmer communities for for seeds, for harvest times, for production and for processing. So all of these steps are being thought through, as I said, kind of right here, right now, as we think about what does a resilient recovery have to look like for our system in each of these different very unique markets and with these very specific types of foods. Mm -hmm. So a quick round to the to the entire panel and in response to your questions as we in response to your answer do as we look at our supply chains uh our supply chains versus the strengthening regional and local supply chains does it mean that we should be less dependent on global supply chains uh should it impact our trade systems rumoriso what do you think um, I come from a country where for some years now we have been importing a lot of food that we probably could grow. So my first comment would be um, COVID has um, highlighted the importance of growing some food, especially highly perishable uh, vegetables locally. Um, we are coming from a country where we have soils, we have sunshine, we have rain. So the 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 reply will be different, obviously, from countries where they ha do not have the climate to produce some of these vegetables. From us, um, this opportunity for farmers to find ways of growing food to supply the local market, and also for the realization of our retailers, because so, so for many years we've been trying to negotiate them to buy um, some of the local produce, but sometimes 
um, they come back with us to say, your carrots are not um, as straight as um, from South Africa. So the fact that there was this disruption really puts us at a place of good negotiation that we are local farmers who can produce and they can um, grow for us. So I would say um, it's, there is that importance of um, looking at what can you grow locally, but we can never discard um, export because we are in a we live in a in a, in a global village where people want to try all sorts of food. So, but we need to look at how can we make it sustainable. I guess that's where the sustainability question always comes in. Terrific, Liam. Thoughts? <laughs> I think actually, Rural Miso summed it up perfectly. I, I think we I think. The, now, honestly, I think the the less um, important question is global versus local. It's what is um, the, the most sustainable farm culture for a specific country. I would fully agree that Africa imports way too much food. Africa as, as a continent should be much more self-sufficient than it is. But there are many countries, take China, for example, that can never achieve self-sufficiency because they just don't have the agricultural uh, land available, the, the fertility of the land and the soil available. Um, so it's, there's always going to be a mix of global and local. And, and the really important issue is um, how sustainable is the agriculture in the specific job. Diane, any additional thoughts you'd like to add? I think Ramiso and Liam have really summed it up exactly. We've got, well, we have to rethink it. We have to build on the pieces that work and really use this as an opportunity to strengthen the sustainability of the system across the board. So going to the audience, Mariso, the first question is for you. What recommendations do you have for navigating governmental bureaucracy that seems to insist on or insist on taxing donations to African research and educational organizations? Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's really about negotiating um, the reason for the tax really with the government. Because when I look at research, um, I think research is very, very important um, for, for agriculture because a lot of the things we need are still in research and caught up in research, caught up on trials. And if it takes 10 years, then it means that agriculture um, lags behind. So I think um, this is where it comes, this is where um, it's important for, for institutions or for people in the country to lobby government and highlight um, some of these things. Because and if you don't lobby for something, you know, you can't change it. So I think lobby for change um, in taxation on research so that you're able to get the research faster and get more money for research um, because the research, we don't really have enough money um, into research and we need this to change, to change our agriculture. Thank you. I, we know that research and, 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 and technology are key to really in uh, the South for leapfrogging many of the challenges that you've identified as uh, necessary to create sustainable food systems in, in your country and others. Uh, the next question was not posed to a particular person, so I'll just read it. And whomever wants to answer, raise your hand, let me know. Do the market failures of the institutional food systems create reasons for much stronger support for local food systems and the infrastructure that local food systems require? I'll read it again. Do the market failures of the institutional food systems create reasons for much stronger support for local food systems and the infrastructure that local food, local food systems need? Any thoughts? Diane? You know, I think this is a topic that we've really touched on already as a panel, I think Romiso and Liam raised these really important points before that we're never going to have. It's not all or nothing. It's always going to be a global aspect to the supply chain and a local aspect to the supply chain. Now, that said, what we are seeing is in addition to having to support much more sustainable practices to ensure that we have a more resilient food system, I am. we are starting to see companies rethink 
where their processing is based, for example, where they are choosing to plant certain crops so that if, you know, rice is a great example, it's such a water dependent crop. Should it be grown in all the places where it's grown today? They're starting to use this as a reason to perhaps rethink where some of these crops should be invested in uh, from a location standpoint. And we're also seeing this as an opportunity to think about, and I, and I spoke to this earlier, but what could be replacing some of these crops? How could we use peep? peas in place of soy? How could we use, you know, different things like this? And how does that create a, a shift in growing patterns and, and processing and then nutrition as well? So it is creating space to have conversations that weren't necessarily top priorities before, simply because so much has to be rethought right now due to the pandemic crisis. And it gets back again, I, I, I appreciate your answer and the recognition that much of the, the, the answer to the question has been touched on by the members of the panel, but specifically focusing on the, the need for these different types of interventions that we thought were too difficult or were not part of the conversation before. Um, Liam, the next question is to you. Does Bayer focus on R&D to develop varieties relevant to the developing world with, lo with local partners so that then it is an ecosystem approach where smallholder farmers get best possible planting material for their region? Yes, uh, thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful question and I can only answer with a, a resounding yes. Um, so, in, in, um, uh, for example, in, in Africa and Nigeria, just to give a concrete example, uh, we work with the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture on uh, what, what's called a modern breeding project, um, working on, on the six core crops of that institute, um, which are key for food security in Western Africa. Um, and this will, will be in part things, uh, crops like maize, but also cassava, yams, bananas. Um, and we make our, um, all of our breeding know-how and relevant breeding know-how and, and also partially uh, genomic uh, um, uh, traits and, and, and genetic uh, information available to make sure that the researchers can improve um, on, on uh, basically on seeds that are climate smart for a specific geography and productive at the same time, so highly productive seed quality. So this would be a typical example where we, we actually do this very in close collaboration with, with partners. Um, another one would be water efficient uh, uh, maize, so basically drought tolerant maize. Maize is a crucial crop in, in Africa as well, uh, where, where we work closely together with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others to develop uh, crops which are then made uh, broadly available. We've also given away our intellectual property related to these products so that they can be made broadly available um, and this we see as part of, of our overall strategy that we've got to work um, not just as, as a private company but we've got to work specifically also uh, in public private partnerships um, and not only develop finished products but together with locally relevant partners develop products that are suitable for, for local environments. And as we think about developing those products for our local environment, um, the, we, we've all agreed that our globalized food system today is quite efficient, where it lacks agility. And so one of our questioners asked, um, as we think about building resiliency along the lines that you've all described, and uh, the uh, making our systems more agile as we've all agreed is necessary any departure from the food system as it is today is likely to have financial and potentially additional carbon costs for our last question who do you think will pay the 
to will pay for this increase of resiliency and sustainability of our food system? Will it be the farmers, the multinationals, consumers, or another group? Who wants to start? Diane. I'll go ahead and start. I'll wade into this one. It's a good, it's a good challenge. Um, let me take a different approach than what we've been talking about to date on this call to answer this question. And that is, there we, we've brought up a little bit, Earthrin, and Liam, you did as well. How do we pay farmers for sequestering carbon? How do we bring that type of fee to the farm? And there's science that still needs to be completed on this, but one of the things that we're working on quite actively is how to look at the connection between these types of nat natural climate solutions, these nature-based solutions for climate and agriculture and creating a very clear bridge between the investors who need to create in addition to the work they do in their own supply chains and offset for their emissions and use that as real-time funding back to farmers to help ex accelerate their investments in carbon sequestration practices through the work that they're doing. There are some great examples of this already occurring. Australia has been a leading market in this. We're starting to see some US markets crop up and there's been other places already, but what we really need to do is be able to scale this and have the type of scientific agreed underpinnings to become something that companies all across the value chain from food to other sectors can actually then say, this is how we're offsetting our scope through emissions, through direct and indirect investments. That starts to get very exciting. And there's quite a bit of work underway to actually make that possible. Liam, anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll add one. I, I think um, um, we're actually, as a society, we're already actually paying a lot more today for our food than what we pay in the in the grocery store or anywhere else there are additional costs related to the system today that are not necessarily baked into the cost of food and i think as that becomes more and more apparent it becomes easier to price food accordingly and and that's not necessarily now on top cost it's just a shift of cost i think related also what to what what diana said and um, there is a, a tremendous opportunity, and, and I think this is often misunderstood, um, there's, there's a perception that you can only increase productivity and efficiency at the expense of sustainability. With advances in, in technology and innovation nowadays, we can actually bring these two together. You can be more efficient and productive and more sustainable at the same time. And, and exactly this, this example in farming, um, farmers can be very efficient and productive with crops, but through some changes in how they do the farming, they can actually sequester a lot more carbon than, than what they might be doing today. And if we hook them up to all the companies who are making all these wonderful processes about offsetting their carbon emissions, there's not enough carbon out there to buy. If we can hook them up to those companies through a carbon trading platform, there is a ton of money there that could then flow back to the farmers who at the end of the day are doing all the, all the hard work to make everybody fed again. So it is possible. For Mauricio, let's hear your thoughts for our, for our closing remarks. Okay, so who pays? Who benefits? We all benefit because we all want a healthy planet. For so long, we have expected farmers to bear all the costs um, and everyone else to not be part of the talk. But I think we need to look at a place where everyone realizes that we all benefit. Therefore, we all need to chip in into the cost. And farmers have always had the smallest piece of the pie. How do we help farmers get a bigger piece of the pie as an, in, an, an um, incentive for them to grow things in a sustainable way? Then we will see change. Thank you. Well, thank you for those words. There's nothing left, left to say. We all benefit and we will all benefit if we treat our farmers appropriately and fairly because they are the base of ensuring that we can build back a better food system. 
Let me thank you, Liam, Diane, and Rumiso for your insights and your expertise today. This has been a very thoughtful and valuable conversation. And I thank you to our audience for joining us. And I'd invite you to support the Chicago Council today to you can provide uh, you can help us continue to provide timely global affairs content by becoming a member of the Chicago Council. Go to www.thechicagocouncil.org slash donate. You can join the council for as little as $100 and to continue the great programming like we enjoy here today. So uh, I, uh, I thank you for us, for your continued support, as well as for your donations. And I remind you that a recording of this program will be available on the website, the YouTube, as well as on the YouTube channel and the council's social media platforms shortly. Thank you again.